Coming up is Thomas Flagel, who will present Enemies No More, the Great Gettysburg Civil War Reunion of 1913. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Thomas is an assistant professor of American history at Columbia State College in Tennessee. And he is a doctoral student in public history at Middle Tennessee State University. He works with many preservation groups, including Civil War Trust and the Franklin Battlefield Preservation Commission. And he serves on various boards of directors, including the Battle of Franklin Trust, Franklin's Charge, and the Carter House Museum in Franklin, Tennessee. Tom is the writer and narrator of Sesquicentennial Stories on WAKM Radio, which is a series that was nominated for the Peabody Award in 2011. He is also the author of the History Buffs Guide series of books about the Civil War, the Presidents, World War II, and Gettysburg. Would you please help me extend a warm Sacred Trust welcome to our next speaker, Thomas Flagel. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, uh, Gettysburg Foundation. Thank you for coming here on this warm day. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. And ladies and gentlemen, what an anniversary it was. Crowded streets, thriving throngs, martial music, a true spectacle of flags and bunting. But enough about today, let's talk about 100 years ago, where this town played host to the largest Civil War reunion ever held. And essentially this morning, I want to hope to answer two questions. One being, what did the veterans see when they came here? And two, what fundamentally brought them here? Well, what fundamentally brought them here was a true achievement as far as engineering, organization, funding. Around about 1909, the state legislature of Pennsylvania said, maybe we probably should do something for the 50th anniversary of the largest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. And the United States Congress and the War Department and many governors said, yes, indeed, we should. And they started raising money and they started raising state commissions to organize and invite various veterans groups to come here. And uh, any of you who have ever organized a reunion, you know it was quite a bit of work. They're going to need a few things, a few tens of thousands of tons of things. They started to think, well, we need uh, about 13,000 night lamps. We'll need about 100,000 blankets. We'll need about 400 Boy Scouts, 1,500 United States military people to help organize police and take care of the veterans coming. We'll need the United States Red Cross. We'll need the help of the War Department. They did realize that we're going to have to take care of every possible contingency. The average lifespan of an American male in 1913 was 51 years old. The average age of a Civil War veteran at that time was 74. They had scores of nurses, thousands of tents, aid stations, dozens of doctors. They even had field hospitals all over the place, including one at the base of Cemetery Hill. I don't want to criticize them ex post facto, but I don't necessarily know. I would have put a, hist a hospital next to a cemetery. <laughs> I think it sends the wrong message. Here's where our B team is. Nonetheless, this was a city, a city of over 6,000 tents that could hold over 55,000 people. This is a massive tent. This would be dwarfed by the entire thing. What amazes me about this whole event is that city that they made for these men, streets, four artesian wells, 32 drinking fountains, aid stations all over the place, 87 field phones for them to call home and say they made it safely. This city dwarfed the city of Gettysburg by a factor of 9 to 1. In fact, if you counted all the veterans who came here, they would outnumber the population of Washington, D.C. in 1860. This was an achievement. And when they came by train and car and by foot and carriage, it was an enormous amount of people. They were expecting about 40,000. It ended up being around 55,000. 22,000 veterans from Pennsylvania alone. 8,500 from New York. 
almost 3,300 from Virginia, 1,200 from North Carolina. They came from Nebraska, Iowa, Arizona, California. 46 of the 48 states were represented. Altogether, 44,713 Union veterans, 8,694 Confederates. And strangely, they were under strict orders. In the tent city, there shall be no women, there shall be no children, no family members, no non-veterans. All food and entertainment is for the veterans alone. You will bring your own soap and towel. You will be given two blankets, eight men to a tent. You will wear badges that indicate what brigade, what corps, what division you belong to. You are allowed one carry-on. No, that's actually true. They were allowed one carry-on. They said, you can't bring trunks or anything like that. We don't want baggage all over the place. Uh, and the veterans were relatively okay with this. They said, well, fine. We're pretty much used to taking orders from the military and our spouses, so we're good. And when they came here, they said, you will be celebrating four days, July 1 through 4. And the epicenter of this whole thing will be that grand tent. To the left of it, you can see the Kadori House and Farm. In the distance, you see the uh, Seminary Ridge. Right across diagonally from that grand tent was Emmitsburg Road. Uh, sadly, I think, the organizers also said, you will stay in the states of your origin. We have it all plotted out for you. We'll have most of the Confederate states over by Seminary Ridge. We're going to have most of the Union boys over by Emmitsburg Road, and you will stay in the tents with each in which you were assigned. And so, on July 1st, they commemorated the very first day of this celebration, and they called it Veterans Day. The organizers uh, overlooked something, though, on Veterans Day. Almost all the speakers were not veterans. They gathered inside this beautiful tent. It's a massive thing. About 2 o'clock, boys of gray and blue, 13,000 people fit into this thing. To give you an idea how big that is, 13,000 is greater than the number of men Robert E. Lee sent forward on Pickett's charge. It was an achievement, but it was almost completely politicians giving the speeches, and the speeches had a very consistent tone to them. One uh, basically set the tone for the entire four days. Uh, one speaker said, so long as men love valor and worship heroes, the name of Gettysburg and of those who fought there will be ever on their lips. He concluded by saying, no man of purer spirit ever lived than those who waged it, being warfare upon the respective sides. This man who was essentially glorifying war was the Secretary of War, uh, Lindley Garrison, a man who had never seen combat. When the boys wandered out about 4 p.m. from the tent, they were kind of having mixed feelings. They didn't know what to think about what they heard. Oh, we're gods of war. Isn't that nice? They didn't know necessarily what to do with themselves, and they started looking at each other. There's only one thing on that first day they truly, totally agreed upon, and that was they loved the food. 156,000 pounds of meat, 25,000 dozen eggs. My arteries are actually clogging talking about this. Ice cream, cakes, coffee, pies, tea, potatoes, Maryland corn, Georgia, water, Georgia watermelons, Pennsylvania potatoes and gravy, roast pork sandwiches, bacon, eggs, fried chicken. To you and me, well, we can actually walk about 100 feet and get about 2,000 calories with a snap of a finger and a swipe of a card. Food was life to these men, and it drew them back 50 years previous of when food was so difficult to get a hold of. One veteran said, Gosh, is the, isn't this great feed? 50 years ago, all we got was sow belly and hardtack and hardly enough of that. They remembered when their average weight was 143 pounds. Food was a celebration to them, and it was delivered by over 2,100 cooks and bakers, 173 kitchens. The smell of fresh bread hung in the air all day long. One soldier said, I saw loaves of bread heaped as high as houses. Everybody got all he could eat and more. They also got a tremendous amount of satisfaction from this, not only because they were 
being celebrated. They were told, when you are coming, expect nothing more than the United States rations. And when they arrived, they got all of this. They also got a tremendous amount of fresh water, which was very soothing to them. It was as hot today as it was then. They also knew, back in the Civil War, as we can talk about battles and glory and valor all you want, you know and I know and they knew. The vast majority of soldiers died not from battle, but from disease. And I don't know if we know this, though, the vast majority of that disease was delivered by contaminated water and food. Typhoid, cholera, diarrhea, dysentery actually killed more soldiers in the American Civil War than the Battle of Gettysburg and the Battle of Chancellorsville and the Battle of Fredericksburg and 1st Manassas, 2nd Manassas, Atlanta, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, Franklin, Stones River, and Shiloh combined. Food was life and death to them. Then came July 2nd. They called it Military Day. Well, they finally let a few veterans talk, but it's still mostly politicians. They gathered around 2 p.m. in the large tent and listened to men talk about glory and valor and how wonderful combat was. And the men wandered off about 4 p.m. And uh, one observer said something rather fascinating here. He said, the exercises in the great tent were interesting, impressive, and well attended, but There seemed to be more pleasure for the majority of the veterans in wandering over the battlefield or visiting around the camp. Now, this is a phenomenon I find fascinating. The men gathered not necessarily in the most famous places of the battlefield, but where they personally fought. They actively sought out neighboring regiments who fought there and opposing regiments who were there as well. And they started to talk. What did you see? This is what I saw. Let's try to make sense of this. It wasn't all serious necessarily. The men were rather jovial. There was a good sense of humor about it. At one point, a lot of the Union boys went over to the Confederate side of the camp to invade it. And they started to talk with each other and reminisce and again try to figure out, what did you see? This is what I saw. Let's try to make sense of it. it was men making their own fun, but it wasn't necessarily all fun. All these speeches of everything going wonderfully and everybody hugging and having some sort of kumbaya moment wasn't necessarily true. There was instances of assault, fist fights. There's one story that in a private tavern, or pretty close to the Jenny Wade house, uh, boys in blue and gray were sitting down for a little snack and a couple of terse words were exchanged. And before you know it, the men were reaching for the nearest weapon they could find, their dinner forks, kind of jabbing at each other. I wonder what it was like for the wait staff trying to split apart that septuagenarian tussle. Careful, Sergeant. Don't try to hurt anybody with that ladle. This, though, was true. A lot of Union men were very uncomfortable seeing veterans on the southern side put up the stars and bars. And conversely, a lot of boys from the South are not necessarily kind and warm to the idea of, reminding, of being reminded again and again, you were defeated here. It was difficult, but I think that's what was so beautiful about how generally well it came along. Most of the activities of the veterans were unplanned. They came to each other's tents and they talked it out. Help me try to remember what I want to remember. Help me try to figure out what happened here. Help me try to forget what I need to forget. Around about the turn of the century, Dr. Sigmund Freud uh, created something to help people work through traumatic injury. He called it psychoanalysis. The boys in blue and gray would give it their own term. They would call it the talking cure. Then came July 3rd, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary on the day of Pickett's Charge. And the organizers, in honor of that day, decided to call this day Governor's Day. 
It was all politicians, each and every one of them. The Speaker of the House, Champ Clark, the Vice President of the United States, uh, Thomas Marshall, governors from 11, 11 different states, including South Dakota with its 125 veterans present. On and on and on they droned to these men. And when it was over, they said, well, we have something special for you. We're going to take you veterans out to the angle, the stone wall, the epicenter of Pickett's Charge. And you veterans will sit there. Thousands of civilians came to listen and watch what was about to happen. They had about 180 Union men from Alexander Webb's brigade on the Union side, standing next to the wall. About 100 feet away was the survivors of Pickett's Charge, 120 of them. And then they waited in the hot, weary sun for the bells of Gettysburg to strike 3 p.m. The very moment, the very anniversary, the golden jubilee of that tragic charge. And when the bell struck three, the men were told, you will now listen to another speech. Third District Representative of the United States Congress, one J. Hampton Moore from Pennsylvania, stood up and started to tell the veterans, blow by blow events of Pickett's charge. At one point, at one point, you kind of think some of the soldiers are going, yeah, 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 been here, done that. <laughs> on and on and on he droned for more than 15 minutes. The men were getting extremely tired. Remember, the average age is 74. And right when he was done, he starts going on about Betsy Ross and the old glory. And they, I, I, I wish I had a time machine to go back and wonder if some of those men were thinking, man, if we still had our guns, <laughs> we might be able to chase him off. But then, when he was finished talking, they said, boys in gray, proceed forward, reenact your charge. And they let out a howl. And the thousands of civilians who had gathered to listen to this uttered an audible gasp. And the men proceeded forward. Many of them on both sides were amputees, on crutches with pin sleeves. Several of the men helped each other walk. The Union men couldn't contain themselves. Many of them scaled the wall and started walking as fast as they could to their old foes. And with outstretched arms, they reached for each other and held each other, and many men cried. From beginning to end, Pickett's charge took about 60 minutes. These men had been fighting with those memories and all the memories of that horrific war for 50 years. And there was only one true group who fully understand what they went through, and that was their own federal veterans of that battle. The officials couldn't restore order. The men talked and cried and laughed. Uh, they said, um, the evening celebrations are canceled. Go off in the tents. And it's exactly what the men did. They wandered off to the tents and talked to each other. They practiced the talking cure. The great event to end it all was supposed to be July 4th. And this was the plan. It was going to be National Day. The President of the United States and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Edward White, were supposed to come here and lay down a cornerstone to a massive peace memorial. It was supposed to rival the size of the Lincoln Memorial. That was the plan. But the President, the Chief Justice, and Congress said, well, we're about to go into recess. We really don't have the money or the time to get this done. We'd love to come. We'd love the idea of a peace memorial. We just can't do it. They eventually, the federal government eventually did build a peace memorial 25 years later. But at the last minute, on June 28th, Woodrow Wilson goes, I know I can't get away with this. I have to go. He spent most of the morning visiting revolutionary sites, especially Yorktown. And here's a man who was born in Virginia. He grew up in Georgia. As a nine-year-old, he remembered wrapping bandages for Confederate wounded. And he said, I, I probably should show up. 
And he does show up, and he goes to the great tent, and he says, well, I can't necessarily give you a peace memorial. I'll give you the next best thing. I'll give you a speech from me. And he proceeds to tell the veterans, we have found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer. Our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except that we shall not forget the splendid valor. Then he did something that utterly shocked the veterans. He got back into his motorcade and he sped off. He was there for less than 55 minutes. He left right before the culminating end of the four-day commemoration. When at noon, and, and this boggles the mind, at noon, every single veteran who could stand stood up and when the clocks of the town struck 12, they stood at attention for five straight minutes, giving honor to the men they used to be, giving honor and thanks to the 650,000 conservatively estimated men who died in that war. They gave homage to the half million men who were wounded in that conflict, the three million altogether, most of whom were long dead, who had seen the largest, bloodiest, deadliest war the United States had ever faced. And then one by one by one, they said goodbye to each other. They disembarked for the trains. It took about three days to get everybody back home. Sadly, on this very hot uh, anniversary, Nine of the veterans didn't make it back home. They died mostly of heat exhaustion and heart disease. One veteran, going back to his home in Indiana, uh, disembarked when the train stopped in Cincinnati. He wandered off and got lost, and he died of dehydration. So what was this all for? Why did they come here? They came here for the very same reasons we do to honor those long lost and loved, to go to cemeteries and memorials and monuments and say thank you. They went the same reason we go to family reunions, for a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of shared memory, to know who we are and where we come from, to have in this world of constant change a sense of continuity and stability. And it isn't just through the bloodlines of family. We gather together through those who have gone through shared experiences and survived, those who have gone through cancer, those who have survived combat, those who have survived 9-11. We mark our years and our lives with anniversaries. This is hardwired into our system. We need to do it. And why? I think Abraham Lincoln said it best 150 years ago. He reminded us this nation and life itself is a life in progress. A fact that the veterans who gathered here 100 years ago knew full well. That things aren't necessarily forgotten, but things can be forgiven. That demons can be exercised, but slowly and painfully and with the help of each other. That Gettysburg Address said it beautifully. We're fundamentally a nation of, by, and for the people. It's because we need each other. We must be here dedicated and committed to work and live of, by, and for each other so that our memory and the memory of those who went before us, who built this great nation, will not yet perish from the earth. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Flagel. Now, to all of you, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll come around so that he can answer those questions for you. So, in uh, 1913, uh, a major logistical effort in order to be able to get 
uh, the troops to Gettysburg. Railroads and electric trolleys. Do you want to comment on the effort that was put together to bring those people here? Especially the trolley. I was quite interested in that. Oh, there was an electric trolley that went right through the park. It's interesting. They were, they were wondering whether or not there would be any veteran, veterans to show up. And in a way, they kind of designed it that the veterans on the Confederate side would be on one side right down, right on Pickett's Charge. It was divided by another train line, the, Pets, uh, the, uh, the Gettysburg and uh, Harrison, uh, Harrisburg rail line that split through there. This was a nation of rail lines. Uh, when many of these were born, these guys were born, rails were the cutting edge of transportation. And, in 1840, but there was only 3,000 3, miles of rail in the United States in 1840. By 1860, there was 60,000. By this time, there was 140,000 miles of rail line in the United States and crisscrossed all over Gettysburg. It was a confluence of roads back in 1863. By 1913, it was a confluence of railroads. That was our interstate of the time. And indeed, you can actually see and have one of the guides show you there are actual beds where you can see where the electric trolley ran through here in Gettysburg and the train lines ran through here in Gettysburg. It wasn't until about 30 years ago that we decided, well, you probably should start tearing down some of these rail lines, some of these buildings. They even had an entertainment system here put in the 1950s, I think, called Fantasyland. Right here on the battlefield. And many people got here by way of trains. And a new thing that became extremely uh, available after World War II, the automobile. The family vacation was invented by the prosperity we had in the 1950s. And to attract a lot of families to come here, and I tell you, 90% of you came here with your families. To get them to stay here, they built an entertainment center, the, the fantasy land, to keep the kids here. This place has been swept clean back and forth, and I don't know if it's ever looked so beautiful or amazing as it does today. Thanks for the National Park Service, and thanks for the Gettysburg Foundation, and thanks to you. Uh, was there criticism in the press at the time about um, Abraham, about Woodrow Wilson's not staying and about all of the political garbage? Well, with politics, you have dissent. Can you imagine that? Uh, I love it when people said, can't we be the way we used to be? We're you know, so divided in 2012. Blood state, red state, blue state, I hate you state. And I go, have you read about the Civil War? And indeed, on the 50th anniversary, there's a great deal of criticism uh, about Woodrow Wilson. There was a phenomenal amount of criticism among uh, uh, left-leaning and abolitionist African-American newspapers, collegiate newspapers, saying, where are the African-Americans in this story? Where are the stories of emancipation, about slavery? And the interesting thing is the politicians didn't touch it. Uh, we are still a nation divided on this. but. When it was spoken at the rostrum in the great tent, the ones who brought it up were the veterans. They said there are millions of African Americans, or they use the word Negro, and we need to use education and philanthropy to try to build them up. It was very condescending. But the soldiers were saying we need to build them up to be citizens of the United States. Indeed, in 1923, uh, 1913, uh, segregation was legal across the land, in part because of Supreme Court justice. Edward White, in 1896, he was one of the individuals who voted in favor on the Supreme Court of Plessy versus Ferguson that made segregation legal everywhere. Uh, one of the men who spoke here was a governor by the name of Samuel Ralston from Indiana, who became senator in the United States in 1922, in large part of the support he got Indian, in Indiana from the Indiana Ku Klux Klan because he was very anti-Catholic. One soldier said it best. He said, politicians forget, soldiers don't. There's a tremendous amount of criticism. And I find that also fascinating. They said, where, the, where is the Negro in this story? Where is Woodrow Wilson? Why doesn't he stay here longer? Lincoln stayed for 24 hours. I also wonder, where is the story of the families in this? Every one of you who is a family of a veteran member know that you're the ones carrying the brunt and, and the suffering of having a member in combat. You know what it's like to have that next phone call or maybe a knock on the door be the worst news you could ever imagine. And when he comes home, 
1865, and when he comes home in 2013, and when she returns back, it's the families are the ones who are supporting them. There was a tremendous amount of hostility and frustration and saying this didn't achieve enough. They didn't answer these questions. They didn't solve these problems. And my answer to that is it's a reunion. It isn't for you. It's for the men who fought here and witnessed some of the most tragic for transformative events in their entire lives. You know and I know when we go to a family reunion, the last thing we want to do is try to solve problems. That's why we have the game on. We don't want to address it. We'll get to it in good, clean time. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I believe General Sickles was at this uh, reunion. <laughs> were there any other Union and Confederate generals or famous colonels that were at this reunion? Uh, yes, um, and most of them are on the Union side. Elijah Hunt Rhodes was one of the major organizers and representatives from Rhode Island. Uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was one, one of the most active uh, organizers for the state of Maine, but two months before he got desperately sick and couldn't come. Uh, Major General Brooke, who was severely wounded on the Union side in the wheat field, he spoke at length on day two. Uh, and Daniel Sickles showed up in a wheelchair with his legs, shouting about how great he was. Uh, there's a wonderful biography of one of our speakers uh, today about Daniel Sickles. I mean, there's, there's, there's an active individual. He's one of the men who actually loved battle. Uh, he was a rare animal, but a rare animal indeed. A, a, a rather active career. He was a lawyer a womanizer, an adulterer, uh, a Democrat. He, um, <laughs> one of the first individuals ever to get off for uh, pleading temporary insanity. And one of his lawyers in that defense for when uh, Daniel Sickles killed his wife's lover was a man by the name of uh, Edwin Stanton who would eventually become the Secretary of War under Lincoln. Uh, yeah, uh, but the focus was on the politicians. Almost all the speeches that were quoted were the politicians. Very few, there's 155 journalists who came here from all across the world. And most of them were copying the speeches of the great men, the senators and the governors and the president. They really didn't talk to the veterans, which I think is sad, but also reflective of the time. We were stu still under the fundamental principle of great man theory, that history is, tr is created by the whims and words of presidents and generals and kings and popes. We were yet unable to understand it is the people where the true story lies. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Yes, did, sir. Oh, thanks. Did they uh, k get a lot of this on film? And are there interviews there was of the veterans? There was a film in 1913 called Meeting at Gettysburg. And one of the things they did get was a reenactment of, uh, of Pickett's Charge. They did get that on film. And that was quite touching. Uh, they even uh, presented a film here called Gettysburg. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, film was lost in a fire, and there's only a few still images left of it. So yes, film was in its infancy. Uh, one of the first full, uh, one of the first films ever was in 1903, uh, one uh, film called uh, The Great Train Robbery. And it's interesting, when we had the mechanization and the technology to create film, one of the most common things from 1903 to 1913 to film was. Civil War reunions. That was an extremely common theme among early films. So they, they, to this day, we still call that era, uh, throughout the silent era, the golden era of, of Civil War films, both as documentary and as dramatic film. We'll run the microphone right over to you. I cut this a little short because it is a little hot. I don't want nine more people dying here. That's, I can't handle that kind of guilt. You were talking about the fact that the politicians didn't talk to the veterans so much at the 50th reunion. I don't know if any of you saw the opening of the new museum on Seminary Ridge, the ceremony. It hasn't changed. <laughs> now my question is a very simple question. In 1938, when the veterans held their reunion, of the 1800 and some that attended, there were 70 actual Gettysburg veterans there. Wow. Do you know how many actual Gettysburg battle veterans were at the 1913 reunion? 
That I don't know. But the interesting thing is the invitations were out to all honorably discharged veterans across the United States. So I don't know the actual statistics on it. But it's interesting that you mentioned that because a lot of the speeches were very Gettysburg-centric from the politicians. And I wonder how much that alienated the troops. I mean, you actually think about this. Uh, about nearly two million boys fought in blue and nearly one million boys fought in gray. Even though Gettysburg was the largest battle ever fought in the history of Western Hemisphere, that 180, 50,000 effectives that were here essentially represented 5% of all the boys who fought in the Civil War. So even with this, uh, the Gettysburg reunion was a little bit exclusionary. Yes, ma'am. I came in late. I am from Rhode Island, and I, I was wondering why they didn't have more on the black uh, regiment, especially since Rhode Island had the first black regiment, as far as I know, in the Civil War. It was essentially a, it was essentially a political decision. Uh, Governor John uh, Tenor of um, Pennsylvania said, we're going to allow Confederate flags here. We're going to invite all uh, African Americans to, uh, we're going to invite all honorably discharged veterans to come. But there wasn't an active effort to bring African Americans. And indeed, with the Emancipation Proclamation, that brought forth 180,000 African Americans to fight in blue. Uh, most of them who were born in the North could read and write and were free. And they were quietly excluded. Some were here. Not many, but by that time in 1913, African Americans in the United States already knew they not only weren't necessarily welcome in Gettysburg, they weren't necessarily welcome much anywhere. It's, it's one of those sad things. I, I need to mention this. In World War I and World War II, when the industry started to explode with two more great global wars, uh, jobs started opening up in uh, the urban centers in the north, Detroit, Philadelphia, Boston, New York. And massive waves of African Americans moved north for job opportunities. They felt as if it was a great liberation for 300 years to finally be out of the cloak of the South. And they didn't leave the South because that's where the support networks were, their communities, their families, and churches. But World War I and World War II allowed them to have a chance to get out. And when they did get out, they did get good paying jobs and really good factories. And then when those wars were over, those jobs went away and they were stuck. In 1950s, there were 15 states that had segregation laws, public transportation, education, social events, segregation laws. All 15 of those states were former slave states. The northern states didn't even have to have those laws. The African Americans were basically already segregated in the urban centers. Yes, uh, could, you, could you speak a little bit about any events that they had scheduled in for the 50th for non-veterans, if any. And also, if you have time, uh, could you speak about the any earlier um, gatherings here prior to 1913 that might have taken place? The question involved uh, whether they had any civilian activities involved. I honestly don't know. I haven't actually researched that. It would be interesting because one estimate has 100,000 100, citizens who come here. Uh, my focus was mostly on the, the veterans, but the interesting about the reunions here and elsewhere, there's a very consistent pattern. It took about 20 years for the veterans who, to want to talk at all about the war. Civilians and veterans alike just really didn't want to think about it. And this is very typical behavior. And then after time passes, and several of you know this, you have relatives or yourself or veterans, it takes time. And then the older they get, the more they open up. And by 1890s, reunions were very commonplace, and they started to have a lot of joint reunions. Uh, much of it was around themes of reconciliation. Much of it was around themes of, of peace and forgiveness. Uh, and by 1913, the significant thing here is they go, we're running out of time. We have to have one big last one before they're all gone. These men are, are, are beyond their life expectancy. But by 1890s, reunions became a very common thing. And it wasn't necessarily battles, per se. Uh, one historian counts there was at least 62 support new network reunion groups for POW survivors of the Civil War. So yeah, about 20 years to 50 years onward, it was a very common method for men to get together to say goodbye to each other, hello to each other, support each other, and try to just talk through the trauma they'd experienced. I had read somewhere that 
there were women involved in the battle, some disguised as men. In fact, it mentioned one even killed here at Gettysburg. Can you speak on that? And did any women, veterans, attend that reunion? I have no idea if any women did. Some historians argue back and forth. Was it 60 women who dressed up as men? It was about 400. We don't necessarily know. Uh, I, I, quite honestly, I, I think there's, a, there's been attention about the oddity of women in combat, but I, I, I think my emphasis and my, my doctoral work is primarily the effect of wars upon society. I think the story that needs to be told is the effect of wars upon the citizens. There is absolutely no such thing as a battlefield. This is fought in people's homes and their barns and their yards and their fields and their towns. One of the saddest things about Gettysburg is that both generals, George Gordon Meade and Robert E. Lee, thought Gettysburg was the preliminary battle to a greater showdown somewhere around the Potomac. And when they left here, and uh, a Vietnam veteran and a great historian, Gregory Coco, said they took an estimated 80 to 90 percent of their doctors, their ambulances, their medical supplies with them, leaving behind around 27,000 wounded here in Gettysburg for the people to take care of and the people who, st who stepped up were the females, uh, including the Catholic Church. There's no such thing as a, a, a nursing school in the United States. The Catholic Church had a long tradition of taking care of the sick and wounded and so they actually came from Philadelphia and Boston and elsewhere. Many women here uh, uh, gathered together, found food, found blankets, their homes were turned into hospitals. They had saved an untold number of men, and they don't. There is one single monument to women in this entire park. Of 25 different monuments and tablets, there's one to women, and it is to Elizabeth Torn, a woman who lived uh, at the Great Gatehouse at the Evergreen Cemetery, and she helped build a uh, bury over a hundred men, and she was pregnant at the time and her child did not live long afterwards. And I wonder to what extent it was from the trauma and hard work she did to try to bury those souls who died here. They were living in an era where there's no such thing as FEMA, no Veterans Administration, no Medicare, no Medicaid. The pressure came upon the women. And one of the most fascinating statistics that still haunts me to this day from the American Civil War, over 40% of Union dead and well over 50% of Confederate dead were buried in unmarked graves. Which means when Robert E. Lee and U.S. Grant shook hands at Appomattox and brought brotherhood and peace and forgiveness, they brought brotherhood and peace and forgiveness to two men, Lee and Grant. The families of the country had to take care of the rest of the garbage and destruction they had bestowed upon us. Think of that. Nearly half of all Confederate dead are buried in unmarked graves. In other words, there's no closure for hundreds of thousands of families. They didn't even have places to which they could go and mourn. And indeed, we have our veterans who sacrifice and work and die and suffer. And we should honor them, but I think we should also collectively honor the entirety of the country that helped heal those wounds when the battle is over. Those are the unsung heroes that I find most fascinating. We'll have time for one more. Question. Isn't this cheery stuff? It's one of the reasons why historians aren't necessarily invited to parties a whole lot. <laughs> we just get on a theme and get really down and dark. One more, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Why is the title of your speech, Enemies No More? Very good. It was a line from Woodrow Wilson's speech. And I have a, a hidden theme to it, that when we call it, when I call it enemies no more, he was saying, all is forgotten, all is forgiven, you have no suffering, you have no memory of this, it's all great and wonderful and val valorious and isn't it great. My hidden theme in this was, these are men who are going to be very soon no more. And the one overriding message they had when they came here, when they went to the cemetery, when they went to the monuments, when they went to the tents, when they came to each other, the word was goodbye. 
you and I are not going to be long for this earth, and I have to say goodbye. We are going to be no longer, and I need to say that to you. So I also say that to you, and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.